The modern landscape of the RTS is barren in comparison to the other genres of games. The real-time strategy game, RTS for short, was pioneered in 1992 by Dune 2, and iterations of the game found their way into the Command & Conquer, Warcraft, and Starcraft series. In the late 90s, early 2000s, a huge surge of games found success in the RTS genre, from the Dawn of War franchise to the Age of Empires series, and even console-based RTS such as Halo Wars. This is just a short summation of the popular games, and ignores many of the other huge RTS titles within the time period. But the end result leaves us in the same place. Our year is 2017, and there is a paltry amount of RTS games that have even been released. However, in this list is a game, Tooth and Tail, that finds itself in a great position, an entry-level RTS game. The genre is one that has a huge barrier to entry, and this game capitalizes on the missing market for games that fall within the easier side of the spectrum for being able to pick it up and play. This game does a whole lot right and distills the complexities of other RTS games and focuses less on the micromanagement of materials and actions per minute through its unique use of its leader system. So what exactly is Tooth and & Tail, and what traits really make it stand out? The game setting places you in the middle of a Russian animal revolution as you find various different interests vying for power. The power to eat. The characters, anthropomorphic vermin, rats, other small rodents, and birds, set themselves apart from the other animals by feasting as civilized members of society. This civilized way of eating involves eating meat. Meat that is taken from prisoners of war, from those that are chosen to be eaten, so that the status quo can be upheld. The grains that are eaten by other animals are scoffed at, and even the animals that eat the grains are treated as subhuman not given the same rights and respect as the others. The graphical fidelity isn't anything to write home about, but it doesn't detract from the game either. The light wear and tear on graphics also means that the loss of frame rate due to the game being too busy or intense is non-existent, only adding to the appeal for beginners and newcomers into the genre. The graphical styles reminiscent of 32-bit graphics as sprites are used as character models, but the animation quality on the characters is smooth and looks seamless from one animation to the next. Admittedly, however, because of the art style, I thought a group of the units, the frogs, were crickets on my first look at the game. The single player campaign places you in the middle of a revolution where you control one of each of the four factions. Playing the single player campaign will familiarize the player with the controls of the game, rallying troops, building units to face off against the opposition, and finding which units provide advantages and disadvantages to other units. Each mission in the campaign is received in the respective home bases of each of the factions after speaking to certain characters. Each of these hubs has other units of similar races to the troops you control within the missions that provide dialogue, giving deeper insight on the true ramifications that the War for Revolution is having. Once you accept a mission, you are placed in a procedurally generated map, a random map, that has objectives that are unique to each mission. The units that you have available in each mission are the ones shown on the pre-mission briefing. Though the missions in the first campaign are straightforward, they increasingly become more complex and varied, placing you in different situations that you must find your way out of. The different conditions within each map also change in complexity, providing a spike in difficulty as you begin to round the ending of the game. If the main mission objectives aren't challenging enough, there's an additional criteria on each mission that, if completed, gives a heroic finish, along with a steam achievement. These criteria also range in difficulty, making some missions nigh impossible if a map isn't created correctly. The single player mode ultimately becomes incredibly hit or miss due to the procedural generation of maps within the game. The procedural generation of maps, the creation of random maps with specific requirements, is a double-edged sword in terms of gameplay. The random element of the map means that scouting objectives and enemy locations are incredibly important and the level of strategy needed to adapt to each level's requirements and enemy placement is maintained with each mainline mission. This allows for even the earliest of missions to be varied and difficult, depending on what kind of map seed you were given to start off the match with. However, the other edge leaves the end game missions incredibly difficult to the point that within the first few seconds of being in the map, you may need to reload it in order to successfully complete the objectives for that mission. The single player campaign ultimately is not incredibly heavy on story as most of the narrative is told prior to the beginning of each mission via text. This, however, does not mean that the story isn't charming. It's a story of rebellion and betrayal, and each of the characters that lives within the game shares their experience with the player in small tidbits of dialogue in between each of the main missions. 
It's this dialogue that fleshes out the world and the motives behind each character, as well as adding jokes here and there to break up the bleakness that is starvation. The skirmish mode can be played by other humans or AI, and it includes a split-screen mode for couch co-op. The skirmish mode can hold up to four players, and no player can choose the same leader as another player. There are a few match setups within the multiplayer as well. Choices of free-for-all games with three or four people, lopsided matches, 3v1s, 2v1s, as well as a two-on-two -two match. However, there's a lack of game types within the game. No matter the amount of people within it, it's largely the same. Build your gristmills, build your army and defenses, destroy the opponent, or make them starve. This isn't so much a detraction from the game, as much as it's a side note if you're looking for other playstyles. Once you choose the game type, you go on to pick a leader. The choice of leader is largely aesthetic, but it does change the voice lines and voice actors that are used by your in-game leader as well as affecting the color of the rest of your units. If any CPU players are going to be used, then you choose the difficulty that you'd like them set on, ranging from training dummy to ruthless. Upon making this choice, you gain the opportunity to choose 6 unit types from a total of 20 unique units within the game. Each unit is unique and separated into 4 different tiers, a 1st tier, 2nd tier, 3rd tier, and defensive tier. This helps identify which units are the most cheap and disposable to the strongest and most costly. Each unit type comes with their own characterization text, giving each animal a reason for joining the revolution. This defensive tier of units is purely made for defensive structures. Turrets, cannons, aerial turrets, barbed wires, mines. It must be noted that certain units are designed in particular ways to give them an edge in play. The skunk units use grenade launchers that leave a weak poison cloud on the ground to damage units in the area. This alleviates torrents of units running into your base, or the falcons, the winged demons, are able to fire off a volley from a machine gun while also being untouchable by enemies that can't attack or reach aerial units. Once all the players have locked in their unit choices, they're placed on a procedurally generated map and they must scout and build to ultimately destroy their enemy or enemies. The matches are relatively quick, around 6 to 10 minutes, and there aren't enough resources on the map to be able to stretch out too many long extended fights, ensuring that the fast paced nature of the game is maintained. Depending on your earlier choice for CPU difficulty, the amount of resource the enemy has varies. Enemies above medium difficulty have an increased start in comparison, having more farms built within their bases, as well as having some starting units, depending on how high of a difficulty they're at. Ultimately, the game is a unique take on the RTS genre as it steps away from the high intensity actions per minute by slowing down the game. It's accessible to newcomers to the genre and it's viable to play using a controller, giving it an edge over more complex controller based RTS. However, despite the ease of accessibility in terms of gameplay and even price, the game servers are mostly empty. It's a game that serves this niche in the RTS genre that is sorely needed. And though there are some detractors out there that scoff at this distillation of the complex RTS mechanics, the game shouldn't be overlooked. It's a game that came to tell a compelling story in a setting not touched very often, with a charming art style and accessible gameplay. Tooth and Tail is an RTS in a genre that has been ignored. It's a diamond in the rough. Your